In this video, I'm going to introduce six principles of scientific thinking that will guide our learning throughout this video series. I'm going to start motivating this by introducing the confirmation bias. The confirmation bias is a tendency that we as humans just have, and it's a tendency to seek out evidence that supports our beliefs while denying, dismissing, or distorting evidence that contradicts them. Now this won't be the last time we see the confirmation bias, but I bring this up just to say that biases like these make it really hard for us to just rely on intuition and common sense to understand the world around us. And these six principles of scientific thinking that I'm going to introduce in this video are designed to minimize the effects of those sorts of biases. So let's start with scientific thinking principle number one, which is ruling out rival hypotheses. Ruling out rival hypotheses is a principle that asks, is this the best explanation for the finding? Is what I'm seeing, is what I'm hearing the best explanation, or are there alternative explanations, rival hypotheses for the results? Let's say, for example, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, or whatever, and you see this headline. A study shows that depressed people who receive a new medication improve more than equally depressed people who receive nothing. So, if you were depressed, would you be convinced by these results? Would you go out and buy this medication? Would you think that it's effective? I would argue that this is very poor evidence for the effectiveness of the medication. Why would I argue that? Because in a variety of psychological studies, we know that the expectation of improvement can actually lead to improvement. So even if the medication is totally bogus and ineffective, even if it does nothing, you'll see that people tend to improve because they have hope and because they believe that it will help them. And so this is called the placebo effect, and it's a rival hypothesis here. It's an alternative explanation for the results. The difference between the two groups could be due to the placebo effect rather than to the effectiveness of the medication. Okay, next. This is a big one. One you may have kind of heard about before, but it's worth reiterating. Correlation versus causation. People make this mistake all the time. Just because two things are associated with each other, this doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. And I'm going to dramatically introduce this key phrase here that I want to ingrain in your brain, which is that correlation does not equal causation. Now, a correlation might equal causation, but it doesn't necessarily imply causation. You can't make that inference just on the basis of a correlation. Let me illustrate through an example. It is a well-documented finding in the world. We know this and we see this over and over in a variety of studies, that there is a significant correlation between ice cream sales and crime rates. Okay, kind of weird. Why would there be this relationship? Well, there's a variety of explanations we could come up with. Let's start with violating this correlation versus causation principle, right? It's possible that eating ice cream results in more crime. Whatever, maybe somebody eats an ice cream, they get a sugar rush, and they <laughs> do a crime as a result, right? Probably not too practical, not too likely, but it's one possibility. We could also have a reverse causation effect, where crime influences ice cream sales. Maybe people commit lots of crimes and doing so works up an appetite and they go and buy some ice cream as a result. Okay, another probably silly explanation, but it's possible. In reality, what we're seeing here with this correlation is a third variable. It's a third variable effect. And the third variable is actually temperature, which causes both an increase in ice cream sales and an increase in crime. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this that I won't get too in-depth into, but we know over the summer months, for example, those are the warmer months, people tend to buy more ice cream because it's warmer, and also we see higher rates of crime because there are more people out and about. We know that the hotter it is, the more irritable people are. There's just more opportunities to engage in criminal activity. And so it's not that one causes the other, but that this third variable of temperature causes both. Again, correlation between these two variables does not necessarily imply causation. All right, on to principle number three, falsifiability. This states, this principle states that for a claim to be scientific, it must be falsifiable. Notice that I'm not saying the claim must be false. The claim might be true or it might be false. The key here behind this principle is that we need to be able to devise a study to test the validity of the claim. If we can't devise a study to test it, it's not a scientific claim. For example, karma. 
karma might very well be true. What goes around comes around. You do good things, good things happen to you. You do bad things, bad things happen to you. Very possible that this is actually the case. But based on our current scientific powers, we have no ability to really test this empirically. We can't design a study or an experiment that does a good job of testing this, and therefore it is not a scientific claim. All right, couple left here. Scientific principle number four, replicability. This is a pretty simple one, so I won't harp on it too much, but it's a critically important one for science. Replicability states that if a study's findings cannot be consistently replicated, it increases the odds that the original findings were simply due to chance. I won't get into the details too much here, but it's just the nature of the way statistics and science work that if you find an effect, there's always a small chance that you just got unlucky. There actually is no effect. You just observed a randomly extreme result that isn't indicative of the true state of the world. This is why we do our studies over and over in science. Because if we find the same result three, four, five, six times, well then we're much more confident that we're looking at a real effect. Okay, two more principles. Extraordinary claims. This is a little bit of a different one. This claims that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Let me illustrate with another example. Let's say some scientist comes along and says, you know what, I've found that hamburgers and pizza are the healthiest foods that you can eat. Okay, do you buy that right off the bat? I wish this were true, but it's probably not, right? We know from a lot of other studies that the things, the nutrients contained inside of hamburgers and pizza probably aren't that great for you. So you have to look at the evidence and you have to see is this extraordinary evidence to match how extraordinary the claim is? Well, if not, we have to kind of reject that claim. All right, one last scientific thinking principle, Occam's razor. This is also known as the principle of parsimony. Occam's razor states that if two explanations account equally well for a phenomenon, the simpler, i.e. the more parsimonious explanation should be chosen. So in science, we value simplicity. Of course, if there's a more complicated explanation of the world that actually does a much better job of explaining findings in the world, then yeah, we can go with that one. But in general, if two explanations do an equally good job of explaining the world, well, we might as well pick the simpler one. So those are the six principles of scientific thinking, and I really encourage you as we progress through these videos here in this video series that you keep in mind these six principles and evaluate what you're hearing along these dimensions.